Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our health talk. My name is Melissa, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. On behalf of the Patient Education and Engagement Program here at the University Health Network, thank you for attending today's session, Tips and Tools for Inclusive Communication, in celebration of Speech and Hearing Month and National Accessibility Week. I would like to take a minute to first thank our planning team the Patient Education and Engagement Program, the Patient Learning and Experience Centers, and Education Technology and Media Services. Now, a few words about our online format today. This session is being recorded and will be available for viewing with closed captioning at the same YouTube link afterwards. Today, we'll have a presentation for about 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions for the rest of the session. If you have any questions about the live stream during the session, you can email us at pfep at uhn.ca or leave a voicemail at 416-603-6290 and a member of our team will get back to you shortly. On the topic of technology, we realize anything can happen when it comes to internet connections. With that said, should my connection cut out at any point, have no fear, you'll, see, um, you'll be seeing one of my amazing colleagues step in to facilitate this session. We also want to note that some of our speakers are presenting on site at the hospital. Because of that, you may hear announcements or overhead um, alert codes in the background. And if that happens, we'll just pause until they're complete. So to submit your questions for the presenters, we invite you to go to the link on your screen. Um, this link is also in the description box below. You can submit questions anytime during the presentation. We want to quickly thank those who have submitted questions already. It helps us see what people are interested in learning about most. And we have tried our best to, to address these within the presentation, but we can also answer them again if needed during the question and answer period. When you submit your questions, you might notice that it doesn't get posted right away. This is because we're now reviewing questions before they show up for the audience. This will help us make sure questions won't be repeated, giving us more time to address new and different questions. It also helps us prepare how to answer the questions before they're posted. We just ask you to please keep in mind a few things before you submit your question. First, you can choose to include your name or stay anonymous, but please note that others will be able to see your name if you do include it. We ask that you please do not include any personal details about your health or condition in your question. Our health talks are for general health information only. The speakers are not here to diagnose or provide treatment recommendations. We'll try our best to answer as many questions as we can during the question and answer period. And finally, you can also vote for your favorite questions by clicking the thumbs up button beside that question. This will help bring questions closer to the top and they'll more likely be answered. So excited to let you know that you can enter for a chance to win a $10 Tim Hortons gift card. To do so, fill out a feedback survey after the talk. The draw will close in a week on Thursday, June 2nd at 2 o'clock p.m. and we'll draw the name and notify the winner on Friday, June 3rd please make sure to enter your email address correctly and to check your spam and junk folders next week because we'll be emailing you if you are the winner. So you're probably wondering, how do I fill out the feedback survey? Just go to the link on your screen and complete the survey at the end of the health talk. This link is also available in the description box below. After you complete the survey, you'll see another link on the confirmation page, which will take you to, to the draw. Uh, we thank you in advance for filling it out. Your feedback really helps us know what you liked, what we can improve on, and what topics you would like to see in the future. So now moving on to our presenters. We also have Bill Scott, who, is who has navigated the challenges of living with aphasia since his stroke in 1997. Using his bachelor's degree in agriculture and his master's in physical geography, Bill's career prior to the stroke was as an environmental planner for Ontario Hydro. During retirement, Bill has kept busy attending aphasia programs and painting classes, volunteering as a subject for aphasia studies, enjoying activities with family and friends, and traveling to many destinations. We'll also hear from Bonnie Scott, who has been supporting Bill's efforts to overcome language challenges since he acquired aphasia. She has retired from her role in human resources for a Bell subsidiary. During retirement, Bonnie enjoys time with family and friends, as well as Aquafit classes, participating in a book club, and volunteering as a peer support for caregivers of stroke victims. 
Next, we'll hear from Laura Lee McLean, who is a speech language pathologist who has been working with adults with acquired conditions who benefit from augmentative and alternative communication, or AAC, since the inception of UHN Toronto Rehab's AAC clinic in 1997. She also teaches the AAC course at the University of Toronto for the speech language pathology program. We'll also hear from Kayla Morris, who is a communicative disorders assistant, otherwise known as a speech therapy assistant, who has worked in the augmentative and alternative communication clinic at the Toronto Rehab Bickle Center for the past three years. She works in an interprofessional team and customizes books and devices for individuals who have communication challenges. Um, Stephen Hahn graduated with a Bachelor of Engineering from Conestoga College in 2020. He has worked in the IT industry for many years, but is new to the healthcare industry. He recently joined Toronto Rehab's Augmentative and Alternative Communication Clinic as a technologist in 2021. So we have a great group of speakers today. Uh, before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University Health Network operates. At UHN, we strive to provide safe and inclusive care, and that begins by honoring Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are the original inhabitants of this land and for thousands of years have cared for this land. Although we're presenting this health talk in the digital world today, as we talk about what inclusive communication looks like, we want to acknowledge and remind ourselves and we encourage you to do the same too, wherever you're currently located, that we're still on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory is governed by the Dish With One Spoon Guam Poom Belt Treaty, an agreement to share, care for, and protect the resources around the Great Lakes in peace and respect. Today, this territory is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work, learn, and play on this territory. So today, our presenters will help us learn more about having aphasia and using alternative ways to communicate, tips for talking with people who communicate differently, and they'll share some resources and services at UHN and in the community where you can learn more. I'll now turn it over to Bonnie and Bill. Thank you, Melissa. Unfortunately, Bill is not well this week and he's not able to join today in the presentation. Uh, I'll be filling in for him and using his communication application to present his talk about communicating with aphasia. I'm sorry you won't get to meet Bill. However, you will hear his thoughts and his experiences as he would have presented them to you. After suffering a stroke in 1997 that left me with aphasia, I have been on an ever-evolving journey to find ways to improve my communication abilities. Aphasia is a language disorder that is usually the result of a stroke or brain injury. Although competency is still intact, people with aphasia have difficulty to varying degrees with speaking, understanding, reading, and writing language. People with aphasia know more than they can say. In my case, I have difficulty expressing myself as well as understanding what others are saying. My reading is very limited and I'm not able to write. There are lots of techniques to help improve communication success for those with aphasia. Starting soon after a stroke with a progression of appropriate tools and methods to assist communication, you can find many ways to be successful, building on your increasing ability as your confidence increases. It takes some trial and error to develop the strategies that work for you. At the beginning of my stroke recovery, a speech-language pathologist suggested my family compile a photo album of pictures to help me communicate. This was useful since I could flip through the pictures of my family, friends, house, etc. to show others what I wanted to talk about. Shortly after the photo book was compiled, my family added single words to each picture that showed me the names of the people in them. Although I was not able to read, I did recognize many of the names. 
This was my first step in recognizing many words even though I had lost the ability to attach meaning to letters which is needed for spelling. With time, we added lots of symbols to the book that I could point to when I wanted to convey things like shirt, jeans, hat, or emotions like happy, sad, etc. When I couldn't convey these thoughts through speech, I was still able to get very basic thoughts communicated to others by using the visual symbols. In addition, I use lots of physical gestures to convey what I want to communicate. The book evolved to include lots of other talking points like maps, numbers, pictures of stores, foods, etc. I was able to expand my communication effectiveness using this simple tool. I had it with me all the time and used it to get my basic questions and thoughts communicated to others. I gradually added other tools to my communication kit. Since my stroke was 25 years ago, this included a flip phone that I could use in an emergency. I had Bonnie's phone number pre-programmed into it and could call her if I was in trouble while out on my own. The phone could also be passed to others to speak to Bonnie. In addition to a medic alert bracelet mentioning aphasia and stroke, my communication tools include a wallet card that I carry in case of an emergency when I am alone. The wallet card explains briefly that I have aphasia and what that means in order to educate a potential helper that needs to communicate with me. It also has an emergency contact listed on it. It gives me security knowing that I can get assistance even in an emergency. Bonnie also carries a card that explains she is traveling with her husband Bill who has aphasia. If Bonnie had a medical emergency and couldn't communicate with helpers, the card would give them an indication of how to communicate with me. With the help of Toronto Rehab, I graduated to using a portable dynamite computer that I carried with me whenever I was on my own. The computer allowed me to add unlimited information and visual symbols. When I needed to access the pre-programmed information, I would press the icons and the dynamite would speak the words for me. As my confidence grew, the dynamite had limitations since it did not accept photographs or have other functions such as email, GPS, and maps. I have always had an interest in technology and therefore jumped at the opportunity to be a test subject for a new communication application that was to be developed for iPhones. The app allowed us to pre-program lots of information that I could access to help with communication. The iPhone is a very portable device that I used to communicate by pressing the icons and the phone would speak the pre-programmed information for me so others could hear it. The app gave me confidence since I could even use it to order a coffee at Tim Hortons. It had a location awareness feature that brought up the phrases I would need depending on where the GPS located me. Unfortunately, after a lot of time spent on getting all my information into the iPhone app, the app was eventually discontinued. As I improved my communication abilities, I was open to changing technology. That led me to using an app called ProLoquo to go on an iPad. If having a technical aid like an iPad would be of interest to you, take time to find an application that will work for you by working with a speech language pathologist who understands your needs. The ProLoquo to go app works for me. I can program it myself by copying text that Bonnie writes down, or I use words that I see online. This slide shows a typical screen in Proloquo 2 go Each icon leads to another page where I have the option of activating the speech that goes with each icon on that page.
I have information about my family, friends, hobbies, education, career, medical issues, travels, and many other subjects that I can share with others. In addition to symbols, the app allows me to add unlimited photos of my interests such as watercolor painting. It is satisfying to express myself in other ways than language which takes so much effort. I am glad I was willing to try a new activity by taking painting classes after my stroke. Although I had never painted before, it is a great way to express myself. I have now been painting with oils and watercolors for many years. I take pictures of all the paintings I do, and like to show them to family and friends. It is extremely helpful to have visuals to go with my conversation attempts. Talking about the travels Bonnie and I have done is easier with pictures pre-programmed to share with others. I have also added text-to-speech commentary about the pictures from our diary of our trip. I like to follow many sports, since it is easy to enjoy them when language is not needed to watch them. With team names and pictures of the players, I can enter discussions with others about the current sports scene. I have the most success when trying to communicate with one person at a time. It is more difficult to actively participate in large family gatherings or social functions, although I do enjoy attending them. Although I still carry a cell phone for emergency situations, the iPad with Proloquo to go, maps, email, camera, etc. allows me to participate in most conversations when I can't express myself well on my own. Although I can't use the feature of the app that allows people to type in their thoughts to share on the spur of the moment, that feature does work well for those who can spell. When I am with Bonnie, she knows me so well that I don't often need to use the iPad with her to get my point across. My communication journey has been full of challenges since I have few words in my speech, but with the help of technology and the support of family, friends and speech language pathologists at the Alternative and Augmentative Communication Clinic, I've made great strides. Each person with aphasia needs to develop their own strategies that will work for them to be understood. What works for one person may need adapting for another. Since successful communication requires the participation of two people engaged in a two-way exchange, communicating with someone who has aphasia requires understanding and some special skills on the part of their supportive communication partner. There are many techniques that supportive communication partners can use to make their conversations more successful when aphasia is an issue. A quiet environment works best. Restaurants and places where there is background noise like music, TV or radio, or multiple conversations, make it difficult for the person with aphasia to concentrate. Speak at a comfortable volume. There is no need to shout. Speak a little slower than normal to give the person an opportunity to concentrate on the content. Give the person time to start the conversation or to respond to you. Don't jump in too quickly to provide what you think their thought is unless they are expressing uncomfortable frustration. Try to establish the topic of conversation early in the communication through the use of pictures, gestures and words. Are we talking about you? Me? Family? medical things once a topic is established it is easier for both sides to understand what is being conveyed use keywording this is a technique of writing single words in large letters on a piece of paper in front of the person with aphasia 
Many people with aphasia can understand single words on paper, whereas they don't recognize the words when spoken to them. This helps to establish or clarify a topic of conversation, as well as to help the person with aphasia follow the flow of a communication and contribute to two-way communication. Too many individual words on one page, or sentences, are not usually helpful. It is a good idea for the support of communication partner to offer specific choices of two things. For example, would you like coffee or tea? Once you get a response, confirm with them. So, you would like coffee? Too many choices make it confusing. Confirming answers given by the person with aphasia keeps the conversation on track since even yes and no answers can be confused and need confirmation. Gestures are helpful. For example, use a thumbs up and thumbs down to help to clarify answers. Using gestures for things like eating, sleeping, exercising, etc. can help the words make more sense. Write down numbers which are usually more easily understood when the person with aphasia can see them written. Also, seeing a time written as for example 11.45 a.m. is more easily understood than telling the person that their appointment is at 11.45. Calendars are also helpful for conveying information when the person can see the date you want to talk about. Frustration can be a challenge. If you are having difficulty communicating, ask the person with aphasia if it is important that you know what they are trying to convey right at this moment. If it is not urgent, agree to tackle the communication again after a break. If it is critical that you know something immediately, try to persevere using other tactics. Try saying things in a different way if the first communication is not successful. Adding gestures or keywords may make a big difference too. Let the person know if you do not understand them. Don't pretend to understand since this leads to more frustration. Acknowledge frustration on both sides and try again. Be reassuring with the stroke survivor that you know that they know what they want to say and that you are willing to help them. Above all, patience and keeping a sense of humor on both sides is helpful for successful communication. Tackle tough subjects when the person is not tired. It can be exhausting for them to concentrate and have successful communications. Be respectful of the person's competency. Include the stroke survivor in conversations that affect them. For example, encourage a doctor to address the person directly. You can support the conversation with writing keywords, doing gestures, and checking with the person to see if they understand what is being communicated. Offer lots of opportunities to socialize. The more chances to practice supportive communication, the better you will both get it. Educating friends and family about the techniques that work is also helpful so they will feel comfortable communicating with the person with aphasia and will not shy away from future contact. Aphasia can be very socially isolating if we don't take lots of opportunities to educate others and improve the chances of successful communication. Successful communication requires lots of work and often includes many failed first attempts on the part of both communication partners. However, using many tools and techniques, there can definitely be satisfying exchanges that improve with time and practice. Whether you are a person with aphasia, a supportive friend or caregiver, or a medical personnel interacting with aphasic individuals, I hope my communication journey and suggestions for techniques to be used by communication partners will offer you some hope that communication can be rewarding despite aphasia.
We wish you every success in your communication endeavors. Thank you, Bonnie and Bill in absentia. Uh, that was an excellent presentation and, and a tough act to follow. I'm Laura Lee, and I'm the speech language pathologist who works here at the AAC clinic at UHN. And I'm Kayla. I'm a communicative disorders assistant or a speech therapy assistant that works in the clinic as well. Early, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. We'll start again. So you may be wondering how someone like Bill, who has difficulty talking, reading, and writing, create a presentation just like the one you just heard. Well, Bill is fortunate to have very experienced communication partners around him who are able to understand and maximize what Bill wants to communicate. Several years ago, when I worked with Bill on a lecture he was going to give to the U of T speech pathology students, he came to our clinic with general ideas about what he wanted to say. We worked through the messages together using some of the techniques and strategies Bill and Bonnie have already talked about. Then after con confirming the content was what he wanted to say, I wrote down the sentences and then Bill copied the text into his communication device then he used that device to give his talk. This is similar to what Bill and Bonnie would have done for their presentation today. In our slides that are going to be coming up, you'll notice there isn't much, if any, text. We wanted to share how some of our clients see the world after they've lost their ability to read. And we also want to demonstrate how informative and powerful using pictures can be. Next slide. Thank you. So one of our main messages that we want to convey today is that every person who uses AAC is unique in how they communicate. There's no one specific way to interact. There's no one magic uh, bullet that will work. And it's very important to assume that the person who communicates differently understands you and knows what they want to say. It's just that they're having difficulty saying it out loud. There are many different reasons why people can communicate differently. They can be born with a condition that causes it. They may acquire it later in life. The communication problem can cause difficulty with saying the words, but they understand and their language is intact. Or it can affect the language where the person has difficulty coming up with the words and combining sentences. That's what Bill has. It also can affect both saying clearly and language. People may be able to use one or both of their hands to point and gesture, or may need to use other body parts like their eyes or their heads to control their communication devices. People sometimes manage to get some of their messages across and then other times have a terrible time, they struggle. And they often do better with people who know them well than communicating with strangers. Many, like Bill, use multiple and several methods to get their messages across. As communication partners, it's our job to try to help the person communicate as best they can. Next slide, thank you. So figuring out how to communicate with someone who has a speech and or language problem is easier said than done. Bonnie and Bill have provided a lot of great tips, which we will review and add to. Over to you, Kayla. Okay, so now let's talk about some tips for being a great communication partner. So just like any other conversation, when you are communicating with someone who communicates differently, a good place to start is with an introduction. So you can introduce yourself and ask the person their name. You wanna avoid yelling, baby talking, or talking extremely slow. As Lorley mentioned, we always assume competency and sometimes speaking extremely slow can make it seem like the person isn't competent. So it's important to find out how the person communicates as it varies from person to person. Do they use gestures, write their messages on paper, or do they have a communication book? 
often in their communication book or device, or even on a card like the one Bill showed us earlier, they can share how they communicate. So look around to the person's environment and see if you can spot any communication tools and then check for instructions. And if you're unsure even after the instructions, ask questions. In order to make sure you're getting the message, ask the person to show you how they communicate yes and no. For example, do they give you thumbs up, thumbs down, head nod or head shake? It's important to know to make sure you're understanding their messages. We're so used to constantly talking through a conversation. And most times, myself included, we can be very uncomfortable with awkward silences. However, when you're communicating with someone who communicates differently and might not be using speech, pauses are a good thing. It gives the person time to think about what they want to say and compose their message. So as a communication partner, you must be comfortable with silence. Don't try to talk when the person is composing their message. And don't interrupt or guess what they're trying to say without permission. Some individuals like it when you guess because it saves time and it could be one of their strategies. But other people can find it very frustrating as you may continuously guess wrong or they might want to finish composing what they want to say. So just make sure you ask for permission before attempting to guess and remember that silence is good. So nonverbal communication is very useful. And sometimes we don't even realize how much we communicate on our faces or through body language. So in your communication, look for facial expressions and gestures that might give you clues as to what the person is trying to say. Okay, here we have two pictures, very different pictures. And the first one you can see sitting in a chair and looking up at a person or over your shoulder, it's not very pleasant. It's kind of awkward. And you might not even recognize as a communication partner you're doing this, or you might not realize the impact that it has. Instead, looking at the second picture, we wanna interact at eye level to make the conversation more natural. Also make sure you're talking directly to the person, not the parent, spouse, or communication partner. If possible, ask the person if it's okay to have other people's help if you don't understand, but continue to ask them first and continuously talk to them. So we briefly discussed asking yes or no questions and confirming that you understood the person correctly. So not only is it a good idea to ask yes or no questions, but we need to ask the right ones. Complimentary yes, no questions are ideal to confirm the person understood your question. So I'll give you an example. If you're asking the person, would you like to go outside for a walk? And they answer yes. You then need to ask an opposing question like, or would you like to stay inside? In which they should answer no. So if they answer yes to both, you know that they haven't understood your question or you might need to reconfirm their, your, their yes, no method. And we tend to ask a lot of yes questions. And many times people with communication challenges say yes to the first option posed, or they just say yes because it's easier. And that doesn't always mean that's what they want. So the questions that we ask are very important. Another very key uh, tip to be a good communication partner is not being afraid to say, I don't understand. As Bill and Bonnie mentioned earlier, don't pretend. Usually the person can tell and it causes more frustration. Sometimes repeating back what you did understand can help the person know what they need to fix. For example, it sounds like you're talking about getting something to eat, but I didn't understand what food you're asking for. You can also ask the person to say it in another way. Sometimes rephrasing helps instead of just repeating back the same message. And remember, this goes both ways for the person and the communication partner. If the person in, isn't understanding you as the communication partner, you might want to consider saying your message in a different way. Sometimes it also helps to have context. 
actually a lot of the time it helps to have context. So try to figure out what the topic is before working on the specific message. You might want to use visuals and main ideas. For example, is it about sports? Is it about your family? Is it about vacation? Then you have context to help you determine a specific message. As the photo says, good things take time and communication is one of those things. Take your time and keep it a positive experience. It can be exhausting for both people involved. And sometimes taking a break helps and there's nothing wrong with that. Other times you might not be able to figure out what the person is trying to say. You can ask if it's something that's important and that they wanna keep trying at or just try again another time. Some people need to be reminded to use their tools. Bill and Bonnie talked about the tools that he uses, uses and that Bill has used in the past, such as his communication book and device. Other people might need reminders to pull out a paper and a pen if they write, get out their communication book or device, or use gestures. And finally, be yourself. Use sarcasm, humor, whatever you would normally use in a conversation. Make sure you're relaxed and having fun. So just to remind everyone, everyone who communicates differently and uses AACs are unique and they do have different ways to communicate. You really do need to assume that the person is understanding what you're saying and would be able to answer if they could. If you can establish how the person says yes or no, and then use confirming questions, that's going to ensure that you know the person wants and they are understanding you. And also find out how the person communicates and if there's ways you can help them. Next slide. Avoid shouting and using baby talk. Be comfortable with silences. Only guess if the person says it's okay to guess and just clarify what you're understanding and not understanding. And again, remember, relax, try to use humor, and realize that no one's perfect. So here's a couple of resources if you want to learn more about this topic. So this is a great TED Talk video. Uh, it's a 15-minute uh, video where Glenda uses her communication device to describe living with CP, cerebral palsy. It gives her perspective on growing up with a condition that impacts speech and how it's affected her employment opportunities. She also shares some experiences with communicating with people, different people, some successful uh, experiences and some not so successful experiences. And she shares some tips on how to uh, communicate with people who use AAC. Uh, the Aphasia Institute is, in, provides programs and training and resources for people who are living with aphasia and their communication partners. This is a great resource and program, and Bill has been an active member, member for many years, as you heard earlier, and I recall he was even on their patient advisory committee at one point, so next slide. And the Communication Disability Access Canada, or CDAC, this is an advocacy, nonprofit advocacy organization that's working to help um, people who use AAC or communicate differently have more accessibility within workplaces and environments on more of a federal and government level. So they're doing lots of uh, advocacy in that front, but their website also provides resources and tips and they offer training for people who communicate differently and their communication partners. So if you can't, still can't find what you're looking for, you're welcome to call our clinic if you have specific questions about AAC and we'll do our best to answer or get you pointed in the right direction. Or you can con you're welcome to contact the Patient and Family Learning Centers at UHN. They offer reliable and up-to-date health information to patients, families, healthcare providers, and members of the public. All their services are free and available in multiple languages. 
Thank you so much, Lily. So that brings us to the end of the presentation component of our health talk. So on behalf of our participants and the patient education program, thank you so, so much, Bill, Bonnie, Laura Lee, and Kayla for sharing your expertise and experience about tips and tools for inclusive communication. So we'll now check out this Slido to see what questions have been submitted. Um, if you haven't already, um, you can still submit questions. So to do so, just go to slido.com and enter UHN Health Talk, that's one word in the event code. And you can also use the um, your smartphone's camera or QR code reader app to scan the code and it'll take you to the page. We just like to remind everyone that if you choose to include your name, um, others will be able to see it or you can stay anonymous. Um, please also remember, do not include any personal details about your health or condition in your question. Uh, the questions are being reviewed beforehand, so um, just to make sure that they're relevant. Um, we also want to note that we may rephrase questions just to help clarify them for the speakers. Um, if we haven't covered your question fully, we apologize, but please feel free to email us afterwards and we'll get more information for you. So starting, for the, um, starting from the top, the first question asks, or says, I heard an AAC device can prevent my child from developing natural speech. Is this true? Um, so I'll turn it over to Laura Lee to answer this one. Hi there. Yes, an actual fact, a lot of people also ask if a person has had a stroke and if they use a communication device, will it prevent them from learning how to speak again? And the research is in and the answer is absolutely not true. Um, that uh, if, if, if a person can speak, they're going to use speech. Using AAC is hard work for our clients. And in many cases, especially with kids, it actually helps them be able to use more of their natural speech. So no worries, AAC isn't going to stop anyone from speaking. Thank you, Lorelli, for clarifying that. Okay, so the next question. How do I find out what type of AAC is best for me? I think, Laura Lee, you can start us yeah, off. That would be me again, I think. So yes, um, the best way is to, in Ontario, is to um, get seen probably by an AAC clinic, if possible, um, where you would have a team around you who would be able to determine what is going to be work best for you in your situation and your environments with your abilities. So to find the clinics, you could either contact the assistive devices program, which um, certifies AAC clinics across the province, or you can call our clinic and we'll try to um, direct you to the appropriate clinic. If that's, uh, if we, you know, every clinic has its own mandate and its own kind of people they see, but we'll try to find a resource and clinic that would work for you to be seen. Thank you, Marley. I guess a follow up question would be, would someone need like a referral to be able to see an AAC clinic? Uh, so I, so every clinic is so individualized in terms of, um, cause there's clinics that only see kids. There's clinics who see adults. There's clinics who see adults with only acquired conditions. You see clinics. So it's a really mixed kind of service delivery across the province. So I think the best answer is get some, you know, we can get you in touch with the appropriate clinic and they can share the information on whether or not they need referrals or not. Great, thank you. Um, and if you need um, access or would like the, the clinic's phone number, we've also listed it in the description box below so you can easily access it or of course rewind this health talk to that slide. Thank you, Laura Lee. Okay, the next question, and I think this is a little similar, how do I obtain an AAC device? Is it free in Ontario? I think that's me again. Um, so it's not free, but it is heavily subsidized by the Assistive Devices Program, ADP. So they pay for 75% of the cost of the equipment. And then if you're on assistance, it might the rest of it might be covered, but otherwise the other 25% would be your responsibility. But then to access that funding, you definitely have to go to an ADP accredited AAC clinic. Thank you. Okay, so the next question. So Lena said, um, maybe there's two communication situations. One, those who are close and communicate frequently, such as Bill and Bonnie. And two, those who make a short contact, like Bill at Tim's or a specialist at the hospital. 
Any tips for those quick contacts where you don't know much about the person's abilities? Okay, Bonnie, go ahead. Oh, a, a couple of things that, uh, that Bill uses is in a situation where a person is not familiar with his level of communication, he presents his wallet card first, which just gives very brief ideas on how to communicate with them, uh, that he's missing uh, the ability to read and write and that kind of thing, and to slow down a little when they speak and write numbers down, those kinds of ideas. Sometimes it's good to call a clinic ahead of time if they're going for an appointment and let them know it may take a little longer because this person has aphasia and explain a little bit ahead of time so the person is aware uh, before, you, before you get there. And um, Bill doesn't just carry his iPad with his ProLoquo program on it. He also carries a multitude of things when he's on his own. It gives him a sense of confidence. So he carries maps. He carries his old communication book because sometimes he likes to whip out a, a picture, you know, to show someone, first of all. So those are some of the things that work for Bill. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Oh. The next question, this is a question for Bonnie. I'm sorry I can't ask Bill directly. How has technology helped make communication more accessible? Has it created any unforeseen new barriers to communication? Well, uh, technology has been fantastic. Now, Bill has a, an interest in technology, so it may be a little easier for him than some other people his age. Um, but he started with a, a simple technology and, you know, he got some confidence using the dynamite computer and then using the iPhone program. Um, and now it's, uh, it's given him a lot of opportunities to communicate with people, even, even with family. He doesn't just use it when he's out and about, but he uses it with family too, because, Frustration can take over when he's trying to uh, discuss something, and uh, he often finds things in the uh, communication app that he can use to get his point across. But it, in a way, it it takes if he's out and about, it takes him a while to access the page that he wants um, because he can't type in a word that could access something immediately. It takes him a short time. So it can be frustrating for the person he's trying to communicate with too, if he can't get to what he wants immediately. So that's that's been a little bit of frustration. Thank you, Bonnie. Oh, Lorelei, go ahead. I just want to add around the barriers. So, I mean, I think uh, sometimes technology kind of overtakes the whole communication part. And we talked a lot about what we call the nonverbal communication or using what other modes. So, you know, if people all get so fixated on the technology, they miss out on the other signals that the person might be giving. So technology certainly is a, is a tool. It's not the absolute answer. It's part of the package. Thank you for adding that. Great. Okay, next question. Another question for Bonnie. Okay, so Bonnie, what have you learned along the way about communicating with someone who has aphasia? We would love to hear more about your experience if you're comfortable sharing. Thank you so much for presenting and supporting Bill to share his story. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I've learned a lot. I didn't know what aphasia was before uh, Bill had his stroke 25 years ago. And at first, I was quite nervous about, you know, how would we continue a, a good relationship without being able to communicate easily, because that's so important. But I, I, along with Bill, who is, um, you know, open to trying new things, which is great. We've found ways to communicate. We've had wonderful, wonderful times together and seen our grandchildren grow up and uh, done lots of traveling. Bill especially likes traveling because he feels that he doesn't have to rely on communication too much when he's away on a trip. And um, 
I've, I've just learned that it takes some patience and we've really kept our sense of humor. And that's been, that's been important too. Even now, you know, we laugh about the things that we don't understand that each other's trying to convey. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I echo that last sentence. Thank you so much for supporting Bill to share his presentation today. Okay. So the next question asks, what do you wish more people knew about living with aphasia? Well, I'll take that one if that's okay, Melissa. Um, I wish more people knew that having aphasia, um, while it may be a communication disorder, it's like other um, problems people have. If you have a physical problem, you kind of need maybe a ramp to get into a building. If you have a communication problem, you need communication ramps. And those can be all sorts of things, gestures and um, uh, using communication devices and uh, all sorts of things that, that help you communicate with others. So um, I wish people knew more about what aphasia is. I certainly didn't know what it was many years ago. And I think if more people were aware and, and had a, just even a slight idea of what things you can do to help people communicate, it would make it easier. And um, people with aphasia would be more uh, willing to go out and be social. Go ahead, Kayla. I just wanted to add, um, I think just from hearing other patients and people's experiences that um, if people knew more about communication challenges or aphasia that a lot of the times um, the person the person is very competent they still know what they want to say and they're having difficulties expressing that but I think that would help so that sometimes people don't feel like they have to you know talk down to the person or really simplify too much what they're trying to say you know you need to use some strategies but the person is is competent and understands what you're what you're saying but might just have some difficulties expressing it absolutely thank you kayla and bonnie and hopefully just by attending this talk and learning a bit more you've learned a lot or a lot more about the patient too today thank you okay our next question, another one for, for Bill and Bonnie. Um, so thank you very much for sharing your experiences with us today. It was invaluable and inspiring, I totally agree. Um, it looks like you added a lot of your information to the communication app on your iPad. Is it easy to learn how to do this and how long did it take for the talk you just gave? Well, uh, that's uh, my, my skills and using the app have developed over the years. Uh, Bill took right to it immediately, but it took me a little longer to learn. Uh, when Bill types things into his uh, Proloquo to go, he has to copy words letter by letter. Uh, because he, he can't spell. And so it takes him a long time if he wants to copy something I've written. But for this presentation, we wrote it in Word, actually, to begin with. And then I was able to copy and paste it into the icons on the ProLoco to Go program. So uh, it didn't take too long to transfer it. But as you can imagine, coming up with, you know, what we want to tell people, uh, about aphasia and how to communicate, it takes uh, a while because for me and Bill to communicate with each other takes us time as well. So not sure exactly how long it took, but the programming itself went quite quickly once, uh, once we had the, the words written. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks for sharing that with us. Okay, next question. Are there any assistive devices for a severe stutter? Go ahead, hmm. Laura Lee. That's a tough question. Um, I'm not an expert in stuttering, so maybe we'll have to get more information for you. I mean, there you know, people, you could use many of the techniques and strategies that you've seen here if you're willing to use a different way to communicate, a different tool um, in terms of some kind of device that's going to reduce a stutter. I'm not sure if there's anything out there yet. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. So whoever asked this question, if you'd like to email us at pfbp at uhn.ca, we can try to see if we can find some more information for you, or we can get back to you with some more information as we've looked into this some more. Thank you. Okay, looks like we have one question left, but I see we still have a bit of time. So there's still time to submit questions if you're still thinking of, of what you'd like to ask the presenters. Um, but we'll take a look at this one. So someone says, I have a trial version app for 60 days. What are the choices we have when the 60 days ends? And I think this app may be like a communication app. Uh, okay, um, so if this is an app that you've gotten on your own, you and if you're looking for government funding towards it, you'd need to be seen at an AAC clinic, which probably is, in all honesty, going to take some time. Uh, if the app is working for you, and if it's not too expensive, I would say go ahead and probably buy it. Uh, some of the communication devices that we the government funds are actually really, really expensive. So, you know, they can, you know, eye gaze systems. So controlling devices with your eyes can be like a 10 to $15,000 system. Uh, a lot of these apps, and I don't know which app you're referring to here, isn't as expensive. So waiting for, to be seen in an AAC clinic for six months to nine months may not be worth the wait, but that's, um, you know, if you want to give us a call, we'll, we'll, we'll try to talk about, talk it through with you if you, if you want to discuss that further. Thank you. And I guess if we use like the ProLoquo to go app as an example, is that something that um, an AAC clinic would have to download or set up? Yeah, I don't know if ProLoquo to go actually has a free trial version. I know some other softwares that do. Um, I know it is, you know, a Prolo Quota Go is one of the more expensive apps, so it's probably running around $300 nowadays. Um, but, uh, you know, there are some much less expensive apps that maybe might meet the person's needs just as well. Uh, it's hard to tell from, you know, which, which app they're talking about, I guess. Uh, ADP has a lot of, you know, it's a government, so it has lots of rules that have to be and criteria that need to be met before you're going to get funding. So, you know, whether or not you would be eligible, eligible even for funding is hard to tell right now until we get more information. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, time has gone by really quickly for the last question. So I now see that it's 1.58 p.m. So unfortunately, we'll need to wrap up our session. Um, so I would like to thank everyone for submitting your questions. And thank you so, so much again to Bonnie, Kayla, and Laura Lee for answering them all. Uh, if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, uh, please email us at pfep at uhf.ca and we'll try to respond within one week. Um, the AAC clinic has also graciously offered their phone number as well if you have specific questions about AAC devices and that's also in the description box below or you can always go back to the talk and get that number. Um, and again, your feedback is important to us so please go to the link on your screen and complete the survey or you can scan the code using your smartphone's camera or QR code reader app and it'll take you straight to the survey. Um, you'll also be able to enter a chance to win a $10 Tim Hortons gift card if you fill out a survey. So just to remind you again, the link to enter that draw will be on the confirmation page of your completed survey. The draw will close in a week, so on Thursday, June 2nd at 2 o'clock p.m., and we'll draw the name and notify the winner on Friday, June 3rd. So please make sure to enter your email address correctly and to check your spam and junk folders because we will be emailing you if you are the winner. Lastly, to find out about our next talk, which is actually on stroke, um, subscribe to our online patient e-newsletter and get up-to-date information about events and new resources at UHN. To fill out a form to subscribe, uh, go to the link on your screen, and this will also be available on the confirmation page of your feedback survey if you're filling that out right now. Um, thank you again for attending, and thank you so much again to our presenters, um, and we hope to see you all at our next talk in June. Thank you.